Hi there! I talk about museums a lot on this channel, the problems, the controversies, the things that they could be doing better, but most of the things that I talk about are things that happen on the public-facing side of these institutions. But today I want to talk about something that happens primarily behind closed doors. Budget cuts, lack of funding, and an inherent misunderstanding on behalf of governments, museum leaders, and the general public about how these institutions work has resulted in a shrinking community of museum professionals that are very overworked, but at the same time struggling to pay their bills. As curators, collection managers, front of house ticket sellers, and security officers, we pour ourselves a cup of coffee in the morning in our rundown apartments, and then we go and work in some of the grandest and most recognizable buildings in the entire world, where we are the stewards of the cumulative knowledge of humanity. We are overworked, underpaid, and in this era of misinformation and conspiracy theory worship, we are very underappreciated. Today, I want to talk to you about an aspect of museums that doesn't make the headlines. After years of unmanageable workloads, no wage increases, no benefits, a lot of people, especially from more modest backgrounds, are being forced out of the sector, regardless of how much they love the work. Museums, as we know, are inherently colonial institutions. But right now, there are thousands of professionals around the world that are working to try and make these places a more equitable place to not only visit, but to be employed at. But you can't fix the system if nobody is paying you to do it. How are we supposed to do this important work if we have institutions where you have one person doing three different positions due to cutbacks? The purpose of this channel, and in particular this video, is to show you the reality of museums and the dedicated people who work there. Today I want to talk to you about why museums are such a battleground for decent employment, and to do that I've invited a few guests, a few other museum professionals from Canada, the United States, the UK, and Finland to come and share their perspectives and stories. So without further ado, here they are. My name is Hannah Cornish and I'm the curator of the Grant Museum of Zoology at UCL. My name is Farmer. I'm the manager of Heritage and I work currently in the interior of British Columbia at a museum I call Cameltown Museum. My name is Inari Porpa. I am a communications assistant, <laughs> is my title, in a museum in uh, southern Finland. I'm Sylvie and I am a museum director in Oregon, the United States. Um, my name is Richard Waitman. I'm an assistant collection manager for the British Museum in London. When I was arranging for these interviews to happen, there was one question that I was really curious about. Because all of these fine people are working at different museums around the world and in very different positions, I was really curious about wages. So the first question that I asked them was, do you make a living wage? No. no, absolutely not. I'm not making it the wage that you would expect to as a museum director. So I, I am, but a lot of people in the exact same position as me would not. Um, my only expenses are myself and my dog, and he's pretty cheap, um, and I'm pretty <laughs> cheap. So I'm actually able to save, whereas I am actually being paid below a living wage. And like I make a living wage for the life that I lead, I would say. So like comparing to a lot of other people who maybe have a mortgage, maybe own a car, like I don't have these kinds of expenses. Right. But it's by necessity that I don't have these expenses. So. No, um, me and quite a few of my colleagues are on universal credit, uh, which means our wages do not go up to living wage in the government. Um, as, as much as I, I, I never wanted to do it, but then um, for the last year, um, our, our, our wages were frozen for quite some time. Um, oh. And then last, for last year, things just got uh, unlivable. I, I do, um, but I am aware that for uh, colleagues um, in the sector, that that is not always the case for museum workers at the moment. So um, I don't know what it's like in other um, museums 
around the world, but in the UK, um, wages in the museum sector have stagnated for the last 10 years. So the kind of wage that I would have been on, say, in 2009, which would be about £19,000 a year, um, that is still the kind of wage that um, entry-level positions are advertised at, at some places in the UK today. Yeah, and for context, um, the London living wage, so the wage that is considered to be uh, sufficient to live in London, is about £25,000 a year. Yikes. Yeah. But for museums and how I got to where I am uh, when it came to low wages, or sometimes it's not low wages, sometimes it's not no wages at all, um, because again, to this specific position, um, I had to volunteer. And I couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed to call it volunteering. I had to call it shadowing um, because the museum doesn't let you volunteer for another department if you're actually full time employed there. Um, there's a policy in place to actually stop any member of staff volunteering for another department, even to gain experience into object collections or marketing or learning and audiences or development or anything like that. You can't work for another section for free. And so I had to do it as what they call shadowing, which was not telling my boss and my mind line manager and actually coming out on my rest days to actually shadow um, people in a different department, which then basically meant not having a day off for about six months. So it was working continuously on the weekends when my road was. And every time I had Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday off, I was then using those days um, to volunteer for another department just to build up my CV and my object experience. Um, so I could eventually leave the front of house and actually work back of house. So sometimes it's not even low wages. Sometimes it is going to volunteer on your days off um, if you have any days off. Um, so you can't have two jobs at once or you have to have three jobs at once just to maintain your experience to actually get into back of house work. Um, so it's not a funny anecdote, um, but it just shows you how hard some people sometimes you do have to work to actually yeah. get into these kind of jobs. And even when you do, sacrifice that bit um, the payoff is the objects and the payoff is the people that you work with and see interact with those objects and um, the payoff is definitely not the pay as you heard of the five people that i interviewed most of them say that while they are living very frugally and they are able to get by they are not being paid a living wage. Richard also highlighted something that I think is really important to mention when discussing wages and labor in museums, and that is just how much unpaid labor museums rely on to function. I know tons of people personally who have done volunteering. I myself have been an unpaid intern, and you need a lot of that on your resume to be able to progress in this field. And it's not really fair to anybody, but it's especially unfair to people who can't afford to not get paid to work. This all kind of leads into the next question that I asked, which was, how often do you do work that is not in your job description? Frequently. <laughs> uh, that's the pro every job description in every workplace, um, we'll try and keep it as gray, as gray area as possible. Um, so yeah, you will find you're doing but when I, when I was on visitor services um on the gallery side of front of house work there are many things you do there you don't you might you might be there to stand around and help people evacuate but you're also not there as security to actually drag people out the front door or to clean up vomit or random random kindnesses like that um my job description has that lovely little disclaimer at the bottom that says other tasks as required or whatever so technically no um, but I'm the only employee at Cameltown Museum during the wintertime, um, which means that I do every job uh, from janit janitorial to housekeeping to, um, yeah, Probably. everything. Um, I, I, do, I do do work that's not kind of covered by my job description. Yes, anything from like, you know, once the cotton gloves have been washed, they need to be paired up together. I don't anymore. Like my job description is, is pretty all-encompassing there there's not a whole lot that falls outside of it um but uh, i find myself going to um community events just to get the historical society out there if you work more than you're supposed to you're in a way you're like taking away a position from somebody else like if if you didn't do that they would have to hire somebody else to that yeah so in a, in a way 
if we work too much, we're actually harming our colleagues. I agree with what Inari said here, but it puts the staff between a rock and a hard place because on one hand, the work needs to get done and it's also not the staff's job to hire people. It is the responsibility of management to identify where staff are needed and to lobby for funding or to budget appropriately to make sure that those jobs are getting done and that those positions are getting filled. There's also no shortage of people who are educated and capable of doing this specialized museum work, and there's certainly no shortage of work to be done, but the funding, a lot of the time, is just not there. Properly funding museums gives us the capacity to do the work that needs to be done while also allowing us to put food on our tables. If the staff at a museum are thriving, it shows that education and community are important to the institution and the government that funds it. The second to last question that I asked was, how does all of this affect the artifact collection at your institution? Cuts recently um, and the kind of the failure of wages to keep up with inflation. Um, it means that there are, are collections that are deteriorating when they should be stable. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's going to cause, it, it could well cause problems further down the road. We could lose, we could lose information. We could lose objects. Probably be just my personal view. Um, I see sometimes that I think the lack of empathy towards staff and wages at my level and below um, doesn't have an intrinsic effect specifically on the objects, but it's actually the effect that it has on the staff caring for the objects. And whether that's just on the cleaning side, whether it's on collection side, or whether it's on the visitor services and security side, that there are some people that will still continuously love and care for the objects. I'm definitely one of those. But there are, there are times when you see people, the apathy kicks in, and then it's people will leave the museum and you pay you get what you pay for we didn't we were open seven days a week so two days a week when i was there on my own i was stuck doing front of house stuff because we've got a donation bin and you can't leave that unattended so i wasn't able to work with the collection there's a lot of dust there's a lot of dark corners and there's just a lot of mm, challenges when it comes to creating a space that's accessible to researchers or visitors because the protection of the objects was not been as high a priority, so a lot of them now need more protection than they did 20 years ago. One of the things about our job sometimes is and it's that fear that an object can last, it can, it can exist for a couple of thousand years, and that it's up to us to keep it that way for the next 2,000 years or a few hundred years. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in the world um, next week, let alone in the next couple hundred years. Um, and that pressure that gets added to, it, added to your job or yeah. you don't want to break anything you don't want to be responsible for giving the go ahead for a job that could break something mm -hmm. um, that also adds to the kind of like stress and that apathy again we're talking about can affect the kind of like oh yeah well you know pay me enough to do this kind of like worrying as we have just heard once again from these lovely people this problem doesn't just affect the staff of an institution it not only affects the care and conservation of artifacts, but it can also affect the accessibility of the collection to students and researchers. Staff are the lifeblood of museums, and if they are not compensated fairly or if they are treated poorly, then everything that a museum should stand for is going to crumble. The very last question that I asked was, in the face of low wages, poor working conditions, and burnout, would you ever consider leaving the museum sector? Yes, definitely. The The job outlook doesn't seem great. Um, I kind of want to stay in my area and there are not very many museums in my area. So um, I, I've definitely considered maybe going for my PhD and pursuing a career in academia. Not that the job prospects there are necessarily any better, but and, and if I can, if I'm able to stay in this field and find find work, then yes, I would stay. I would stay in this field, but that's not a given. Not really, but it's partly also maybe because I, I didn't sort of start out 
heading this way. I'm here by accident almost. Yeah, I think if I left the glam se sector, it would be to go to academia, which isn't much better. So leaving somewhere after 20 years um, is a drastic step, um, oh. but you have to go into survivability as well. Um, and yes, I would have to contemplate. If I can't live, then I would have to try and find uh, something else. I don't I would want to, but inevitably that would have to be a choice that comes in. But Yes, actually. So I was thinking about it and um, I did leave the sector uh, and came back. Back when I was a, a recent graduate, I um, was offered a job in a museum that I couldn't take because the pay was too low. And I went to work for a software company for a bit. Eventually, I did get back into museums um, and I had to take a pay cut to do it. Yeah, no living wage um, at mm -hmm. all. And it's kind of down for the wire for a lot of people. And I know some people have left already because the museum just isn't making enough money for them. It's often the people who um, are not privileged enough to have the safety net that, that go. So, um, not to put too fine a point on it, but. Um, the workers in the museum sector, certainly in the UK, um, the middle class white women are overrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's often the people who have the safety net from, say, a parent or a spouse who um, ride out the storm of short term contracts and poor working conditions and poor pay. And then it's um, the, the people who have the voices that we need in the sector, the people who are missing that um, find that they can't stay. I love the work I do. And uh, I think it's important. And, and there, there's an extent to which I think that may be part of the problem because um, it it ties me to the to this job and this field in a way that that I'm sure a lot of people don't experience because they a job opens up that pays better and and they can just take it whereas I I, I feel a responsibility to to continue doing this work in this position. But uh, one thing that I've learned, and I think a lot of my colleagues have learned, and that we always tell students and um, volunteers and um, people who are just starting out in museums, is you must remember that the museum does not love you back. Um, because people who choose to work in museums, they're not doing it for fantastic salaries. They're doing it for the love of the subject and the, um, the objects and engaging with people. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a real danger that you feel you, you come to feel a responsibility towards the objects which goes beyond what you're being paid to do and there are, the, this field relies on people feeling that sense of responsibility i think mm -hmm. because because there are so many extremely smart and talented and skilled people who i've met working in museums who could be making a lot more money doing other types of work and um and I'm glad that they are, that they have chose to do, chosen to do this. But at the same time, it, it, it seems like that they, they're not being rewarded for, for the work and the skill that they're providing. No one wants to leave this sector, but as museum professionals, we are proud of our work. And we have this sense of duty towards the stewardship of our collections and the sharing of this knowledge that it has kind of put us in a vulnerable position where we can be taken advantage of in terms of workloads and wages. I don't want your takeaway from this video to be negative. I definitely think it should serve as a bit of a warning and as a bit of a heads up to anyone looking to enter this field that it can be quite frankly, a cruel and thankless sector to work in. But I also want this to be more than anything, a reassurance that a lot of us are in the same boat. We can demand change and we can push for better pay and work together to transform these spaces into a more equitable and appreciated place of work. A big part of the reason why I started this YouTube channel is because of course, I wanted an excuse to ramble about niche historical topics but I also wanted to brag about the cool stuff that museums are doing. 
and how the staff are working so hard to do so much to educate and inform and preserve human history. The people in this sector are worth fighting for and they are worth protecting. If you are a museum worker, please consider unionizing. Meet with other people from other museums, share your wages, and demand better. There has been a lot of positive change already in this regard. Museums across the United States in particular have been voting to unionize and they are demanding better pay and they are seeing an, an increase in wages and general work-life balance. If you are curious about how other people are demanding change in this sector, I suggest checking out at Change the Museum on Instagram. They are primarily based in the US, but they often share anonymous stories about the need for change in these institutions. And there are also plenty of Facebook groups and uh, Twitter accounts that name and shame institutions for paying low wages or hiding <laughs> the wages in their job advertisements. Despite everything that we spoke about today, I am hopeful. I am very hopeful for the future of this sector. We are all very passionate and very stubborn, and we all know that this work is important and it needs to be done, and I believe that we can do it. Before this video ends, I just want to say a huge thank you to Sylvie, Hannah, Farmer, Richard, and Inari for speaking with me and sharing your stories and perspectives. Uh, please give them some love in the comment section, and uh, if they have a social media in the description, please go and follow them. But that is all I have to say today. I hope that you have a wonderful day slash evening, and I will see you next time.